picking up on the idea of denial, of noticing this historical decline, um, I'm studying economics myself, and it's so shocking to me how few economists are able to rec to just see what seems so obvious and to question like the basic assumption that capitalism is the most effective method of allocating resources and distributing. Like it, it seems so clear. Um, and as a Martian economist, um, there's so little space for that kind of critical engagement. Um, so I wanna ask you, why is it so hard to come across heterodox approaches in economics? How like is, has the, how has academia purposefully been crafted to sort of support these narratives, to support this ideology? But I'm glad you asked because it really is my life. And I can tell you the story as I experienced it as well. Um, my parents were immigrants to the United States. Uh, I was born in Ohio, I'm as American as it comes, but neither my father nor my mother were, uh, they became American citizens, but they arrived as immigrants. Um, and if you're the child of immigrants, as I was, and if you're the first child of immigrants, which I was, you are under a tremendous psychological pressure, which I really would not wish on anyone, but that was the roll of the dice, that's what I had to do. And I had to make up to my parents what was destroyed or interrupted in their lives. They could, my mother couldn't ever finish college. She had hoped to. Uh, my father couldn't stay with his uh, chosen profession. They came to the United States. They didn't have a, a nickel, you know, and they had to kind of scrabble around. But I had to make up for them. So I had to always get good grades in school. And I had to play the violin in the orchestra. And I had to pl play on the football team. I did all those. I actually did. And as a result, you become quasi-hysterical. Uh, you have a lot of psychological problems, which I will not share with you. I have to know you better before that happens. Um, but I had the following uh, academic experience to answer your question. I started off, and since you're in Massachusetts, you will understand what I'm about to tell you. I went to Harvard. My undergraduate experience was four years down the road there in Harvard Square, Cambridge, Massachusetts. When I finished, I went to Stanford in California for my graduate work in economics. I only stayed a year because Stanford was, how shall I put it, a boring, dead place. And so I left there after a year and finished my education in New Haven, Connecticut at Yale University. So you're, you're listening to a, a poster boy for elite education. I have all the pedigrees that this system offers. Okay, so I had the teachers who tried very hard to persuade me that capitalism is absolutely the best thing that has happened in the world since sliced bread. Okay, they try. I also had fellow students who were eager, smart people and wanted to absorb, as students usually do, what the teacher offered to tell. And if you go through that kind of a system, you learn an awful lot. My classmates at Yale, for example, you might be interested to know, included a woman. And that was very rare. In those days, economics was a field that men dominated in, in every way. All my teachers were male. And the vast majority of my fellow students were male. So when there was a woman, you know, we all noticed, oh, there's a different kind of person over there on that sheet. Her name was Janet Yellen. Okay. That's my, that's my life. 20, 20 semesters, 10 years I spent, 10 consecutive years, two semesters each, Harvard, Stanford, and Yale. Now here's what you're going to learn. On only one semester, it happened in Stanford, one semester, one professor gave me some books and articles, the whole class, not just me, but assigned some books and articles that were critical of capitalism. One. The other 19 semesters can be honestly referred to 
as learning how to be a cheerleader for capitalism. It's efficient. It, re, it arrives at a wonderful equilibrium that has the quality of optimizing the general welfare. The very language of this discipline is reveals a lot. That's what I was taught. Economics as it's taught in the university, and by the way, I've taught at Yale, I've taught at the City University of New York, I taught at UMass and Amherst, and I teach now at the New School. So I've done a lot of teaching, and I've taught in Europe, and you know, I, uh, because my parents were immigrant, I was fluent in French and German uh, before I learned English. So I, I can move around because I, I speak those languages. So, okay. I would raise my hand because I was becoming a little loud mouth lefty already in college. And I would raise my hand and I would ask a question uh, about Marx or about uh, problems of capitalism. And I very quickly noticed something that happened at Harvard, again at Stanford, and again at Yale. Some of my teachers, by the way, were very, very good. Some were mediocre, like anywhere else. But I noticed that when I asked those questions, something that I could recognize as naked fear crossed the faces. You know, nobody said anything, but just looking at another person's eyes, they were of, their eyes were saying to me, don't go there. Don't push this. Don't ask these questions. And they were asking me almost as a kind of kindness to back off. And because I'm not a nasty guy and because these were perfectly nice people, I backed off. I learned the Marxism on my own together with other students that were also interested. But I have to tell you, when I started going to school and we're going all the way back now to the 1950s and 60s, there was no exposure to Marxism, socialism, anarchism, communism, none of it. My generation doesn't know anything. Janet Yellen, good student, clever young woman, clever older woman. I got nothing, you know, I don't agree with her, but she's fine. But when we all got together, her fellow students, to study Marxism, she never came. This was not her interest. This was not her career path. And look where she is. She chose well. She, uh, she's arrived. I'm the weird one. I'm the, you know, the black sheep. I'm the odd, what's this about kind of person. But that's the reality. What you're living through is the results of all of that period. Nobody produced Marxian economics. The only reason, I, I don't mind revealing this to you, the only reason that I spent so much of my time at UMass Amherst, there's a simple reason, because they offered me and four other people, all of us, by the way, males, white males, they offered us uh, uh, a job none of us could refuse. I was I, at the at tender age of 27, the University of Massachusetts offers me tenure no waiting, no, no, right on the spot, come here, you will have tenure, and your job will be to teach Marxian economics. I thought I wasn't hearing right, because that never happens. So I, you are talking to the exception, but it's that famous exception that proves the rule. They hired us. And you know, the other four, I don't know, the names may mean nothing to you, uh, Samuel Bowles, he's the one who put it together. Why Sam Bowles? Well, why do you think we got the job? Sam was an undergraduate at Yale who went to graduate school at Harvard. And I was a student that was an undergraduate at Harvard and went to school, yeah, get the picture? If you didn't have these pedigrees, you didn't get that job. It had nothing to, I could have taught, you know, underwater basket weaving for all it mattered. They were hiring the pedigree, which is normally what's done. You know, and so I have a job that comes out of another part of me. They didn't care about this. Nobody has ever cared about a balanced curriculum. If you ever hear an economist talk to you about a balanced curriculum, go talk to somebody else because you're in the presence of somebody who's either an ignoramus or a hustler. And you know, don't want to waste your time with either one of these characters. In, the, in American academic life, between 19, 
45 and 1975, everybody was a Keynesian economist. All my teachers were, all of them. And my professors, uh, give you an example. The person who taught me macroeconomics at Yale was a man named James Tobin. You may have heard his name because he later won a Nobel Prize in economics and all of that. He used to make jokes in class. And you know, if you're a graduate student in a small room with a famous professor, one of the things you learn early on is when the professor tells a joke, you laugh. And maybe the lamest joke you ever heard, but you laugh with as much of a full throat as you can manage uh, to make him like you and to feel good about you. And which of course I did too, I did too. Uh, he would make fun of this crazy economist, that's what he called him, named what? Milton Friedman in Chicago, a kook, a loony. And I, I laughed each time because, because he was the only place where neoclassical economics was still kind of there. After 1970, it reversed. All the Keynesians were basically kicked out and the neoclassicals led by those who had gone to school in Chicago came in and took over. They hate each other, they fire each other, they, you know, they, they do all kinds of things, not just professional, but personal, very ugly. And one of the very few things that neoclassical and Keynesian economists have ever agreed on is the importance of keeping Marxists out of the curriculum altogether. That they can agree upon. That, that is something they see the importance of. It's embarrassing. I mean, I'm not any more angry. I wasn't angry when I was younger about it because it was really right in my face. But now taking a step back, you can realize this has been a country that had no limits. You know, the Cold War was a reality. The Soviet Union was scary for them. And the result was the behavior of a three-year-old. I mean, the three-year-old, you know, who's scared by the dog that's barking. And he or she, the little kid, puts his or her hands in front of her eyes because she thinks, since she's three, that if you can't see it, it isn't there. In the United States, we acted as a nation for half a century, as though Marxism and socialism, is, we're not taking it seriously. Let me put it this way. For most of my adult life, when I would go out speaking, say for uh, every once, every once, every three months, somebody would ask to talk to the professor and they knew a little bit about me. Now, by the way, just to show you how much America has changed, I do three or four radio and television interviews every day. You right now are my fifth television or internet type appearance. The demand for what I do is now enormous. <laughs> and because of American history, the supply, uh, the supply chain has been interrupted. Uh, there aren't very many of us, right? Clearly. But the world has completely changed. And But you're surrounded by an economy run by people who have no idea about the critique of capital, none. None. By the way, that's one of the reasons they don't do real well with these downturns. Because there's no course saying, you know, here's a little piece of information that ought to be in every economics curriculum. The National Bureau of Economic Research, that's an agency that works with the United States government. So its politics are, of course, wonderful. They keep track of economic downturns. And here's what they show. Wherever capitalism has become the economic system in the world, anywhere, whether it was in the 18th, 19th, 20th, or currently, wherever capitalism settles, it has an economic downturn on average every four to seven years. Wow. Whatever the country, whatever the history, whatever, the, the, you know what that means? It means this system is stupefyingly unstable. Every four to seven years. That means in your lifetime or mine, many times we're going to be in an economy that suddenly throws large numbers of people out of work, that suddenly destroys many small, medium, and even large businesses. How do you plan your life? How do you buy a house 
wondering whether you're going to be fired uh, in one of these episodes. Every four to seven years, it crashes. By the way, just so you know how good the job is that the NBER did. Look at this century, the 21st century, 21 years old. We had a crash in the spring of 2000 called the dot-com crash. Then we had a crash in 2008 called the subprime mortgage crash. And now in 2020, we have a crash we call the COVID crash. Three crashes, 21 years, every seven years, right on schedule. You might think this would work to get some attention, that there would be courses in the economics curriculum, crises, crashes, recessions, depressions, why they happened, why they weren't prepared for, why they weren't handled real well, and why capitalism, which has been frightened by and upset by every crash for 300 years and has tried everything it could think of to stop them has failed. That's why we're going through another one and a doozy right now. This, I mean, this ought to be right up there with stuff you learn. You look long and hard. Most economics departments have no course on the business cycle, which is the sanitized name they give it. None. We're all supposed to pretend that this malady, which afflicts this sick system, isn't there. More of that denial. At this point, when I give lectures, I lean across the podium, trying to hold the attention of my audience. And I say, if you lived with a roommate as unstable as capitalism, you would have moved out long ago. <laughs>